And you did not do that with Jack Kowalski, did you? In that first interview with him, me. let me finish my question. In that first interview with him, you did not tell him that you were investigating him for possible allegations or no, a under allegations of child abuse of Maya, did you? I or introduced myself as with the child protection team. I did not go into detail about what that meant. Hey folks, it's Mike from Profiling Evil and I joined Judge Ashley Wilcott today on Court TV to talk about the Maya Kowalski uh, trial that's going on. This is where the family is going after Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, and trying to get compensated for all that they put this young woman through. It even led to her mother committing suicide. But it was Judge Ashley's comment to me and question that really caught me off guard. Well, today's testimony swirled around Dr. Sally Smith, who was a DCFS, that's a Division of Child and Family Services uh, director overseeing decisions in uh, Maya's case. And if you remember, Maya was someone that the family felt and her five physicians, I think it was five, felt she had CPRS, a complex regional pain syndrome, a d disease that they treated with ketamine. Now the hospital and Dr. Smith felt like she was over prescribed and that she was being punished and frankly abused by the parents. The family now is saying it led to the mother committing suicide and uh, that the hospital was out of line. Now, I made some pretty strong comments a few weeks ago on Court TV about what I felt in the case, specifically around the uh, hospital's lack of empathy toward the family when this child was crying out for her mother to be with her and they wouldn't allow the mother to come. And again, many are saying that it led to the mother committing suicide. Well, today, Dr. Smith was on the stand. In that little cut I gave him a few minutes ago, you could see how bristly she was during her deposition. And today was no different. I'll tell you what, this physician is one tough cookie. I don't think, based on my review of the CRPS literature and um, discussions with uh, physicians since then, and in the context of all the evidence that there was of medical child abuse, um, that Dr. Barr's opinion, if that was his, that she had CRPS, um, was reliable. Okay, so now <laughs> Dr. Spiegel is not reliable, and he's a neurologist. At least will you agree that neurology and anesthesiology are the two areas that are most involved in the investigation of complex regional pain syndrome? I imagine those are people that typically evaluate and treat um, patients with complex regional pain syndrome, sure. But not all neurologists and um, and uh, pain management or anesthesia, I'm sorry, not all neurologists or anesthesiologists are, if you will, created equally. There are some who practice at a very high level and when I, having reviewed medical records from all kinds of providers all over the state and even other parts of the country uh, for 35 years, read through information and see all the supporting information that they have and compare that with other information that I gather in my medical record review, I can assess whether the person that, you know, made thousands of dollars was reliable or not. And I didn't find those people to be particularly reliable in terms of their diagnosis, even though I certainly included their information in my report. Dr. Hanna, a anesthesiologist with over 25 years of experience in treating CRPS. You didn't put his confirmation, or excuse me, he did a diagnosis of CRPS in your report either, did you? I believe in the history, I made reference to that. I, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did say that, that he, um, you know, made that diagnosis. But this is a doctor who was giving a child 
a 10 year old child who's on the small side, 1,000 milligrams of ketamine, anywhere between 8 and 32 milligrams of Versed, doses of Zofran, dose 1,750 milligrams typically of magnesium, all at the same time in an outpatient setting with no documentation of, medical, of um, vital signs. And there was indication in the records that appeared to me to suggest that the family member was the person monitoring the pulse oximeter. So that person, to me, is not particularly reliable in terms of whether this child needed the treatment that she was getting, whether he had made an accurate diagnosis or not. So I put his information in my report. Yes, I discounted his diagnosis. And of course, you discounted Dr. Cantu's confirmation of CRPS. Well, I never got any records from Dr. Cantu, so I couldn't really address that whole um, situation other than from the WordPress blog. This person put a nine-year-old child in a ketamine coma for days. It took her probably about a week to just be able to be discharged from the hospital after that. So I, uh, I didn't find him reliable from what I saw. Uh, all right, so if I'm understanding you, the fact that three different treating anesthesiologists specializing in CRPS, two different neurologists specializing in the treating of CRPS, you know more. Fair? I don't know more. I, as I said, I looked at their information, and based on what was done with this particular child, I did not find their opinion to be reliable. And who elected you to be the judge of whether all of these board certified physicians were reliable? Nobody. I presented it to a real judge who made a determination. Well, isn't it true, ma'am, that you are not a medical investigator? You are, in fact, a medical prosecutor. That's absolute nonsense. Because an investigator would include both sides of the story and let the judge decide, right? No. The, the Child Protection Team Medical uh, Director will assess whether there's medical evidence to support a diagnosis of child abuse, and then the dependency attorney will present that to the judge. And the other side gets attorneys also. There were five in this case. And they present all the information, and then the judge um, it, it tries to decide, you know, what, who, whose who's information is more reliable. Here, under oath, are you telling us, are you an investigator or are you a prosecutor I am of neither. the information? I'm a medical doctor who is an expert in child abuse pediatrics. And she took the question from Kowalski's attorney right to task, defending decisions that she'd made based on her expertise and her experience. But I'll tell you what, I wasn't ready for the question that Judge Ashley asked me when she said, is this woman evil? All right, I'd like to welcome my guest for this hour, retired police commander Mike King, also the host of Profiling Evil. And I want to go after that name, Evil, because, Mike, here's the thing I'm noticing. I mean, really, this cross-examination going after her and I'm painting her as evil for being the prosecutor, the judge and jury all in one and saying, oh, this is medical abuse. And, of course, her response, I think, was appropriate, which was, I'm a child abuse pediatrician, but I don't think that's satisfied. Is she evil? Is she the crux of the issue in this case? Heavens no. And I'm not an expert in this, in this area, but th to me this boils down, Judge, to the idea of, what was her position after reviewing all of the information that she had? Whether it's right or wrong is still got uh, is still something that will be decided. But um, to villainize her as someone who was going out with a specific agenda, I think it's a little harsh. And yet, in the same light, could you not accomplish the same thing by saying, "Did you have tunnel vision? Did you?" 
decide too early in your investigation that this was the problem. And so you twisted every fact or discon discounted every piece of evidence that would have pushed you to think or theorize otherwise. And isn't that really the, as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle would say, the capital mistake to theorize before you have all this information? I, I'm just troubled why on earth they would completely discount physicians who have spent their career looking at this kind of problem and not bring them in front of the judge and say, hey, let's really decide what's best for this child. Because there were some indications that the child did better under that therapy. And then when the storm hit, had that cataclysmic uh, decline that led to the hospital. But but uh, I, I still think there's a lot of ground that can be gained by saying they focus too much too quickly on facts that maybe they didn't prove out. And I like the way that you said it, Mike, because to me, that's the way to approach it, which is a little more objective. This was definitely a personal attack, but again, some leeway given by the judge. The judge even said that, I've given you some leeway, that's enough. That well, there you go, folks. I guess the big question is, what do you think about the testimony as you listen to it? Number one, should it matter if this doctor's bristly or not? as long as she has the child's interests at heart. And did that uh, hospital overstep its bounds? So the big question I have for each of you is, did this hospital make the right decision? Did this doctor make the right decision? And how would you be voting if you were on the jury today? I mean, the real question is, did they do what they felt was best in the interest of this child? Or did they make some preconceived decisions perhaps even based on personalities and conflicts that they'd had with Maya's mom and dad and build their entire response around that. I'm going to be looking for your answers down below and I hope you'll take time to watch this trial because I think it is really one of the more important cases that's going on in the court system today. Hey, thanks for your support of Profiling Evil and please Make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you like podcasts, folks, make sure you're checking out Profiling Evil Podcasts. Now listen, at the end of this clip, I'm going to play a little advertisement. So if you're looking for a good Christmas gift, I'm going to have a special on my book, She Knew No Fear. Make sure you check it out and let me know if I can sign one personally to you. Now, many of you have purchased my books through our website, ProfilingEvil.com, or on Amazon. Well, I recently released a newly updated book called Predators, Who They Are and How to Stop Them. It's a book I wrote alongside my friend and mentor, FBI Special Agent and Profiler, Greg Cooper. It's a great read, but I want to talk about my favorite books, which are Deceived, an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult, and she knew no fear. Now Deceive chronicles my investigation into and the ultimate takedown of a ritual cult that was sexually abusing children. You know there were more than 4,000 rapes of those children that occurred in a case that resulted in 12 people being convicted of child sex crimes. I wrote the book after some of the victims reached out to me 30 years later asking me to tell their story. I want you to know I'm not profiting from the book and the proceeds are going toward building a new children's advocacy center, which you see pictured here. It is a place where children can be forensically and physically examined and prepared for the court system. The center is set to break ground in November of this year and I really hope you'll buy my book because the proceeds are going directly to help build that building. Now you can help by purchasing uh, Deceived. The other book I want to talk about, though, is She Knew No Fear. It's the story of the murder of my great-great-grandmother. And the murder occurred on July 24th, 1891. Now, that's statehood day for Utah. I had heard about Jane from my grandfather all of my life. And as my law enforcement career was coming to an end, I thought to myself, wait a minute. I've spent an entire career investigating and solving cold cases. I wondered why I hadn't solved my very own relative's murder. And 130 years after she was shot to death, I solved the crime. I think you'd really enjoy the story and it would give you an opportunity to get a great Christmas gift for yourself or a loved one. 
Now I've priced this book at $30 for a signed hardbound copy of Jane, and you can get it by emailing me directly at profilingevil at gmail.com. And then I'll respond with some shipping and payment information. And we can also find out what you want the book to say in my personal inscription to you. But now let's get back to today's video. Thanks so much for your support of Profiling Evil. And we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.